there's also the question of just plain sustainability. And a symbolic system, a cultural uh, meaning system, is going to have to be sustainable. And only now are we discovering what that means, because our current culture is so unsustainability. And another part of evolution is it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't make everything nice. It doesn't necessarily take you where you want to go. And so that means that uh, we're in a unique situation, given our dominance on the earth and so on and so forth, in which we have to culturally evolve something that frankly never existed before, an ability to sustain ourselves and our world at an unprecedented spatial and temporal scale. That would be a new cultural adaptation. It's not going to happen spontaneously. This is where Chardin actually got it wrong. It's the one big thing that he got wrong, and it was a big one, was the idea that there was some kind of inevitability, that all of this was tending towards the Amiga point. We do not have that comfort. Mm -hmm. We truly do not have that comfort. It's more like building something very elaborate to accomplish this objective of of worldwide cooperation, basically, and and, uh, coordination. That's going to be a mighty construction effort. It's not going to come together spontaneously. The World Wide Web's not going to do it. Uh, it, it might be a prerequisite, but uh, the global brain, there's quite a few authors out there who think that the global brain is just going to emerge. Uh-uh. <laughs> no way. That's going to be an engineering feat and an evolutionary feat. And unless we, unless we uh, manage the evolutionary process... So the bottom line is we need to become wise managers of evolutionary processes. Otherwise, evolution will take us where we don't want to go. Well, I look at it myself as uh, the beginning, really, of, a, of an exploration. That's the reason we're exploring. You don't know what you'll run into on an exploration. What the sky looks like, what the stars look like. uh, Do they still twinkle or are they a steady light when you get outside the atmosphere? Why I advocate a resource-based economy. To this point, after research and degree in international relations studying international political economy, much discussion, polemic and whiskey, I cannot in good conscience or intellectual honesty argue against the inherent logic of the proposal of a resource-based economy. I've tried. There's much to discuss, but I'll boil it down for you. Two core fundamental points. One is a push away from our current system, the second is a pull towards this proposed system. Number one, what we currently refer to as capitalism under various guises around the world, suggested in various doses and concoctions in the prescriptive manuals of political philosophy and economic texts. The monetary-based price system as a means of coordinating and organizing so-called economic activity of consumers, producers, and owners of resources is ultimately unsustainable. The reason for this is that it's essentially predicated upon linear consumption and you cannot run a linear system on a finite planet indefinitely. Producing, 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 selling, 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 buying, 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 and throwing away in an endless linear march would be quite the plan upon an infinite planet replete with infinite resources, which also did not have wholly interconnected ecosystems, webs of life, and biogeochemical cycles. However, this is not the case. This is not our planet, which you can think of as a rather large organic spaceship chilling in the Goldilocks zone of our solar system. A linear consumption global economy can also be thought of as an infinite growth paradigm in which infinite resources, if not literally asserted, is implicitly assumed, whether with regard to energy or any other profit-oriented pursuit of transforming resources into goods and services. Rather like the growth curve modeled in bacteria, exponential growth cannot continue indefinitely. First bacteria adapt to growth conditions, then exponential growth occurs after a constant rate of doubling. As we can see, exponential growth is quickly reached. However, it's bounded by its environment, which it exists within, and is a product of, and hence enters a death phase as it depletes its resources. This is analogous to a global linear consumption economy or infinite growth paradigm of continually exploiting resources indefinitely based upon profit motives rather than genuine human needs and scientifically parsimonious feedback. Our current economic system is not only not properly economic in the true sense, Uh, nor is it a more efficient and direct route to solving underlying issues of human need, but as an operating system it is out of sync with the state of our host planet, its prevailing natural laws and processes.
It does not make adequate room for biogeochemical cycles, relevant feedbacks in life systems, resource surveying and management, renewability, and truly keyed in cutting edge contingency plans for alternative resources in situations of resource depletion, limitation, or collapse. Not only does it not do these things, but it also does not take them and construct a working, constantly updated model on a planet-wide scale. It is therefore highly vulnerable. And as an increasingly interconnected, interdependent global economy, it is still not an engineered scientific system. Hence, collapses and catastrophes in one area intrinsically affect the whole, potentially like a butterfly effect. And due to the fact that it's not an engineered scientific system, it cannot adequately hermetically seal breakdowns or collapses in the first place and does not have redundancy as we would expect in systems engineering. Therefore, fundamental operations from the production of food and medicine to the provision of water and energy are more vulnerable to economic fluctuations and crises, as well as the inherent limitations of requiring money to function in the first place, and dangerous corner-cutting experiments undertaken in a project to attain more profit. The degree to which the operations of food, medicine, water, energy and other crucial life-preserving goods and services are not designed, built up and protected in a truly scientific fashion is the degree to which they're vulnerable and hence you and I are vulnerable. But as I repeat, the main point is that ultimately it cannot be sustained indefinitely anyway, as its mode of operation is not in line with a non-linear, finite planet. It is hence by definition unsustainable and the degree to which this unsustainability creates negative social and environmental feedbacks is the degree to which we need to move into something more sustainable. And hence the second reason for my supporting a global resource-based economy. So the proposed resource-based economy, complete with its systems theory-based approach to engineering a global system that uses cutting-edge scientific technology, is ultimately more sustainable than our current system. It involves the intimate connection of systems engineering and cyber nation in order to survey and track resources and orient production according to both human need and the current availability of resources. I support this not only for its sustainability, but for almost any other social or individual concern possibly raised. It would allow for individual freedom, immeasurable by current standards, and its opportunities for innovation would blow our current ways out of the water over the horizon. Its efficiency and minimization of waste on a holistic scale and structure would make our current approach utterly embarrassing. True individuality would flourish alongside the wider society. There are many, many negatives it would attenuate if not completely eliminate. Wholesale corruption, uh, starvation as a disingenuously touted conundrum. How do we solve starvation? Give me a break. Inefficiency in production as well, useless goods and crappy services, the result of limited buying power, blocks in education, and the utterly reprehensible, unforgivable and immoral blocks placed upon the life-preserving, life-dignifying healthcare that does not belong in the realm of political ideology, but in good, solid, cutting-edge science and natural, intrinsic, human compassion. It is in fact a more rational system, one predicated upon the scientific method as the primary operating mechanism in the influence of the operations of society, rather than arbitrary assertions, ideologies or other biased rhetoric, and certainly not the motive of monetary profit, which as we all know full well, if decoupled from social and environmental concern is inefficient, socially damaging, technologically retarding, environmentally ecocidal and a potential inducer of systematic collapse. It is in short the application of the scientific method to society as a whole. This means what it should mean today. How you get your sanitation, irrigation, telecommunications, your transportation, that your shirt was constructed by parsimonious applications of scientific knowledge and technological methods from the materials to the end product to its arrival in your local area. Applying the scientific method to society as a whole means its functional operations, its technical operations, not whether you watch a sunset or complete a jigsaw puzzle with your kid. This does not mean getting out weighing scales, test tubes and the periodic table of the elements to find out if you should hug your wife or throw a stick for your dog. That is not remotely about the technical functional operations of society. That is your own personal preferences and as long as you want to swing your fists around while singing the Sesame Street intro song, if your fist doesn't end at anyone's nose, we say a salute. What the fuck? I suppose something inside me says, God bless, I salute. Who gives a shit? Part of your new outlook? 
Maybe. I salute it then. It's the whole fucking order, I'll tell you that. My primary reason for supporting this proposal is quite simply that it is more sustainable than our current one. It proposes an economic approach more in line with the natural laws and processes of our planet and hence is more valid in the ultimate sense. After studying and conversing, which I will continue to do and after trying sincerely to find it wrong, I cannot in all honesty deny its validity. We can raise eyebrows and wonder whether such a proposal could come to fruition. We could shrug our shoulders and take a fatalistic approach to humanity. We could shake our head and have the very legitimate concern that the logistics of creating such an idea may cause it to die on the vine as various economic, social and political variables render it impossible. Maybe so, but what I cannot do, what I cannot do, is deny its inherent logic. So that's it. Now some of you are wondering what a resource-based economy may look like. Here it is. Thank you for listening. talk about every day being a gift and uh, stopping to smell the roses. But regular life's got a way of picking away at it. Your house, the shit you own, it drags you down. Your kids, what they want. One bad idea after another. Just trying to work a cell phone menu. It's enough to make you scream. All of the marvels of science and technology, all of the electronics and mechanical wonders, are just so many millions of tons of junk unless it enhances the lives of men. The reason we emphasize machines and technology is to free man. Since uh, the entire ideologies in society who try to rely on biology, I feel a biologist need to speak out on this. And so if I meet people who say, well, the natural world is based on competition, obviously that means that we need to base our society on competition, then um, I feel, I, as a biologist, I do have a task in saying, well, is your picture of the natural world actually correct? Mm -hmm. it, it's a social Darwinist picture, but the reason we call it social Darwinism is because it's not real Darwinism. We try to present society as um, an imitation of nature. Like nature is a struggle for life, nature is a, a nasty process of competition, mm -hmm. and we need to mimic that in society. Mm -hmm. And I'm not convinced that nature is like that, first of all, and I'm not convinced that what nature does needs to be mimicked in society. And my argument would rather be that we have a lot of cooperative and empathic and nicer tendencies, and if that's part of human nature, then that needs to be represented in society as well. We need to build a society that has room for that, uh, and not just is, is based on competition. But once empathy exists, once you have that capacity, uh, and, and there's good reasons why we have it, because we're cooperative animals. Uh, you're welcome to apply it to anything. If you know that we have these tendencies naturally, and that they have a very ancient evolutionary history, you better build a society that takes them into account. I'm, I'm not giving specific instructions of what that would mean for society, because that's a process that people have to figure out among themselves, uh, politically and so on, but, but I'm saying you do need to take that into account.